Welcome, friends, to the Probate Nation. My name is Richard Ruddy. Our show this evening is about how to properly prepare the inventory for a Virginia Testamentary Trust. As we begin this story, I am reminded of a story I heard about a student who attended just the first class of a semester. And, in, and since, it, since attendance was not a requirement thereafter, he did not show up again until the final exam. He scored 95% on the exam, so kudos to him. But the, the professor was shocked because she knew he had not come to class all semester. So she wrote a little note on his exam cover sheet that says, see me after the class. So after the exams were collected and the class was over, the student approached the professor to see, to see what she wanted to talk to him about. The professor said, you know, I, how did you get a 95 on that exam? You didn't come to class. Well, I would have got, gotten 100, he said, but I went to your first class and I got confused. Now, our hope with this show is not, a, is not to confuse you, but instead give you some valuable working knowledge on how to properly prepare this inventory. And to facilitate your learning, we are pleased to have with us Tim Grinnings from Grinnings and Lowell to walk us through the preparation of the inventory. Tim is co-founder of Grinnings and Lowell, a Fairfax City accounting firm founded in 2014. This firm specializes in Virginia inventory and accounting filings submitted to local commissioner of accounts for Virginia estates, trust, and conservatorships. Prior to forming Grinnings and Lowell, he worked as an auditor for the Fairfax County Commissioner of Accounts. So please welcome back Tim Grinnings from Grinnings and Lowell. Hey Tim, how are you today? Hey Richard, how's it going? Nice to be with you again. Very well, thank you. Well, the first thing I want to you know, jump in, I appreciate you taking the time, is to kind of give an overview of the, of the inventory and form itself as far as how, you know, and so let's, let's take a look right away at the top of the inventory form that has a bunch of information that is collected at the very outset. And talk a little bit about some of this information, where can we find it, why is it being collected and all that, if you could. Yeah, sure. So most of the information that is uh, on the top of the form is going to be on your statement of uh, on the statement of qualification. When you go to the court and you qualify as trustee, uh, all of that information is going to be located uh, on that form. So you can fill it all out and um, and go from there. Sure. Now, one of the one thing that can be a little bit of confusion, I think, first is there's a question there about the date the trust was created. So what right. date do you normally suggest folks put in there? Is it the date of will, the date of death, date of qualification? So I usually put the date of death because the trust is, is formed in somebody's will and then it goes into effect when that person dies. So that's, that's typically the date that I put there. Okay, and that's certainly what we suggest. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what is the purpose behind the inventory form that, that we have to file for this testamentary trust? Why, do we, why are we filing it? So the inventory uh, basically reports the assets that you are taking control of as trustee. So it'll serve as the baseline uh, for your accounting moving forward, and it'll be the, the, the basis on which you uh, prepare future accountings. It's, it's, it's the starting point, basically. Okay, and um, <clears throat> do we have to document anything as far as what's in that, what's there? Do we have to prove anything? Uh, not typically, but uh, you don't want to make up values unless you really have no idea. And, and we can get into that later. If, if you don't have any idea, there are solutions um, for that. But, but when you go to do the accounting, that's when you'll want to, uh, you, you don't want to make up values. You, sure. sure. But, okay. All right. So, so let's, let's, let's begin and work, kind of work through the form itself. So sure. uh, they're going to go ahead and show up on the screen the... Um, the actual, well, what the, the uh, part one looks like, which is part one of the inventory from talks about trust assets that are not, that uh, are included here, that everything except real estate. And so, so tell me in, you know, in detail, what are the types of assets that go on part one? So part one assets, again, like you said, it's every single asset that's not real estate. So if you've got cars, boats, airplanes, um, you know, brokerage accounts, uh, CDs, mineral rights, businesses, um, checking accounts, all of that would, would show up on uh, part one. And, and, and what do we put down as far as the dollar amount? Is it uh, the, tell us what we should put down there. 
So the dollar amount will be the value, it'll be the market value as of the date that you received it from the estate under which the trust was formed. Okay, okay. Um, now, if, a, if an asset is encumbered by debt, do we deduct anything off the value reported? No, you always want to just list the straight up market value. You don't list any net values, any um, anything. So if, you, if you've got a car and you've got a car loan on that car, you list the market value of that car, not the market value less the debt on that on that asset. So it's just the market value. And so people sometimes get confused now. When we list this value, this is not necessarily the, quote, tax basis of the asset, because that could be very different from what the market value is at the time you receive it. Is that true? Yes, that is true, because the tax basis could be something entirely different. You, this is just the market value of the asset as of the time or as of the date that you received it from the trustee. Okay. And that's important for folks to keep, we'll keep that in mind when they do from this. From the executor, sorry. Sure. Sure. So let's let's go ahead and take a look at about some talk about specific assets. So we're gonna for our viewers, we're gonna post up on the screen as we go along the various um, specific assets and how they should be reported. So we're just gonna show that on the screen. So you're gonna hear Tim and I talk about this as we go along. So the first one that we're gonna show is 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 cash accounts. So how do I report bank accounts and checking accounts? So for the bank account, you're just simply gonna list the uh, the institution, the type of account that it is, the last four digits of the account number, and then the value of that account as of the date that you received it from, from the estate. Okay. Okay, let's talk about certificates of deposit, which is the next one we're talking. How do we report that? So a CD uh, is a little bit different. You'll report that, again, the institution, uh, make sure you indicate that it is a CD, and then you want to list the face value of it. You don't want to list any accrued interest on that asset because that will mess you up when you go to do the accounting later on. It's, so you just report the face value as of the date that you received it from the estate. And do you indicate how many months the CD is supposed to be going? Yeah, that's that's also good in the in the description to include that information. You want to be as detailed as possible, really. Anytime you're listing it, something on the inventory. All right, let's go to let's go to non brokerage account. These are going to be your investment accounts at Vanguard or Merrill Lynch or whatever it might be. How would we report those? So brokerage accounts, um, you want to list. So you can start off by naming the brokerage account and then listing under the brokerage account name, all of the holdings within that account. So um, so say you've got a Vanguard account and you have Apple stock. Um, you'll list Vanguard and then under that, you'll list Apple stock. And then you wanna list uh, the number of shares that you've got and the price per share, the market value price per share as of the date that you received it from the estate. Uh, and then you would multiply the number of shares by the price per share, and then that's the total value for that one asset. You don't want to just list Vanguard account, $300,000. You want to make sure you include all of the detailed holdings, all of the prices per share, all of the, um, all the number of shares held for each, uh, each individual holding within that account. So uh, sometimes I think we can request from the brokerage house to give us a list of all the assets in the account by asset as of that particular date that we receive them. And then you could, right. you could attach that rather than having to list it. Was that true? Correct. But uh, one thing I would caution is when you do that, sometimes the brokerage firm will include accrued interest. So ah. if, you've, if you're holding bonds or if you're holding uh, cash that's accruing interest, but it hasn't paid yet, you don't want to include any accruals in the value of uh, what you list on the inventory because then that causes confusion when you go in to do the accounting because you're, you're dealing with an accrued asset that you've already reported. Okay, well, that's very important to know. Right. All right, let's talk about individual stocks. Okay, so if I own a Apple or I own... To power, Dominion Power or whatever it might be, how do I go ahead and report that? 
So uh, it'll be similar to uh, the brokerage account, but um, so say you have Dominion stock and it's not held through a Vanguard account or, or any other um, brokerage account, it's just held with that, uh, with that firm. So you have Dominion stock, you will list, I have Dominion stock, I have 10 shares of it. The price per share on the date that I received it from the estate was $100 per share. And then the total would then be 10 shares times $100 per share, $1,000. Okay, okay. Um, the next, uh, next uh, category is retirement accounts. So how, are those, how do those get reported? Yeah, so um, with retirement accounts, it's gonna be very similar to uh, the brokerage accounts. You just wanna make sure you indicate what type of account it is, whether it's an IRA or, or anything of that sort. And then you want to go ahead and list uh, the name of the, uh, the firm and who the account is with, and then subsequently list all of the holdings within that account and the number of shares and the price per share, um, and then the total value of each holding within that account. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, life insurance proceeds. So how do those get reported? So for life insurance proceeds, you want to list um, the policy, let, you know, what type of policy it is, who the policy is with, um, and then go ahead and list the value of that policy as of the date you received it from the estate. And you uh, can contact that, that, um, that firm and they'll be able to tell you what the exact value is as of a particular date. So I, I notice up on our screen, our PowerPoint has life insurance proceeds section. And so the way a trust might also get life insurance proceeds is as part of the planning, they make the beneficiary the trust uh, right. rather than make it the, rather than making it the estate of the decedent. That's how we end up having these these proceeds be paid to the trust. Correct. Okay, so um, how about uh, people own boats and vehicles? How would you suggest that be how does, should that be reported? Yeah, so boats and vehicles, um, it's, it's pretty simple. You want to be as specific as possible. You, you don't need VIN numbers, but year, make, model, um, and then the market value as of the date you received it. And you can get that market value, um, you know, for automobiles. Kelly Blue Book is a, is a quick reference to determine the value. And if you're unsure, you know, if you have a boat and you don't know what it's worth, um, you can you can kind of get an idea if you just do like a Craigslist search or Facebook marketplace of similar items um, and then you can kind of get an, a, an estimate of the value. Okay. And how about if those uncashed dividend checks that I'm holding? What do I, how do I report those? So for uncashed checks, you're going to want to list who the check is from, the date of the check, and, uh, and the amount. And, and that's, that's basically it for for uncashed checks. And I know that tangible personal property tends to be um, this big black hole. Um, right. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, assuming that people have the normal stuff that's floating around their house, you know, that's being conveyed, then we would describe it in some generic way on the, on the, on the inventory form? Yeah, so with tangible property, what you wanna do is you wanna determine if any one item is worth more than $500. So most pieces of tangible property within a home are going to be worth less than $500. And for all of that, you can lump it together and say total tangible property worth less than $500 each, you know, and, and put a value on that of $1,000, $3,000, whatever, uh, whatever you think it would be. But then for each item that's worth more than $500, you want to go ahead and list that separately so if you've got a diamond ring and that's worth $2,000, you want to go ahead and list that separate from the general grouping of tangible property. Okay. Um, lastly, um, some people have closely held business interests that get passed out from the estate into a trust. How should I go ahead and report those? So if you know the value of the business, then, then it's simple. Uh, it's not always that simple because the value of a business is not easily determined in most cases, but assuming that you do know the value of the business, you would simply list the business name, uh, the percentage holding that the trust owns, and then 
the value of that percentage. Um, all right, so um, let's just go. I think we now can show on screen the completed part one, which shows all of the detail that's involved. Uh, and that's uh, a collection of a lot of information um, with a lot of subsidiary schedules to support those numbers. We don't, you know, we don't right. put all of the, that information on page one. We, we put the totals of those various categories. So the next part of the inventory form is basically three buckets of assets that are all real estate related. So yes. let's just talk about the two. One is, is Virginia real estate, which has a power of sale that uh, the trustee has. And another is Virginia real estate where they have no power of sale. So let's just talk a little bit about what go, how do we go ahead and describe, you know, if, for instance, in part two, how do I describe that piece of that, re that, that residence that I have a power of sale? How do I describe that in part two? So for real estate, it's, it's usually pretty simple. After you've determined that you have power of sale, um, and you know that it's going to be listed on part two, you, you can simply list the street address of, of the uh, real estate. And then as, as far as the valuation goes, if, if you've gone ahead and gotten an appraisal on, on the real estate, you can go with an appraised value. Uh, but it's, it's also just as easy to go and use the, uh, the tax assessed value and uh, as close to the date that you received the distribution from, from the estate. Okay. Um, now, I know there are some things that do not get listed in Part 2 or any of the real estate. So tell us about those two different types of ownership interests that do not get listed. Yeah, sure. So um, sometimes real estate is owned tenants by entirety with spouses, meaning that each spouse owns 100% of the real estate. So if one passes away, the survivor still owns 100% of that real estate. And that's not a piece of real estate that you're gonna see flow into a testamentary trust. The other type is um, real estate that's payable on death or transferable on death. Sure. Meaning that um, if it's been specifically bequeathed in a will, to a beneficiary other than the trust, then that would be an instance where uh, that real estate would not flow into a testamentary trust. Okay, and that's true. And, and a lot of times that would never have made it into the estate or anything else at that point. It would, right. it would never pass through. Now, uh, Drops so, like a rock, right? It does, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> now, part three of the inventory um, is those assets that I do not have a power of sale over. So, It'd be similar kind of asset, same type of description as you described. It's just that the difference is that we don't have any power of sale. And if I wanted to sell it, I'd have to go to court and get a court order and get permission to sell it. Um, right. What about the non-Virginia real estate, which is in part four? Um, what, how do we go ahead and about and describe that? Yeah, so the non-Virginia real estate is going to include, obviously, all the real estate that's not located in Virginia. And whether or not you have power of sale or not, it's all going to be listed in part four. And um, for that, you can just simply list the street address of the asset. And then, uh, again, either the, the appraised value or the tax assessed value that, that was made closest to the date that you received it from, uh, from the estate. Okay. Well, I think at this point, then we're we've got we've collected everything on the inventory, and I think we have a PowerPoint that actually shows the completed inventory. And the inventory is, I think, four pages long. And the there's a the last page of that inventory, and you can see as you look at that page one, page two, page three, page one collects all this information. Uh, one of those numbers that it collects at the top of that page one has to do with the total that has to be bonded. So some right. of the asset is, it has to be bonded, whether it's bonded with surety or not, that tells us what in the number is supposed to be. And that becomes important uh, during the review process. But there's a, there's a signature page. Um, tell me a little bit about the certificate of accuracy. In other words, they have to sign off, but they're certifying certain things when they do it, aren't they? Yeah, so um, you're certifying that to the best of your knowledge, these, this is a true and complete list of the values of uh, that you hold as trustee and and you're the fiduciary so you know you're you're you know in charge of these assets that are are not probably not for your benefit unless you're also a beneficiary so um, you know that's why you want to do your best to make sure that this is a complete 
an accurate uh, list of the assets under your control. Sure, and that, that certification is under penalty of law, so you do want to make sure you do a good job with that. Now, For sure. So let's just turn to, you know, you were a former auditor from one of the, for uh, the Commissioner of Accounts, so tell us a little bit, what are some of the common problems that, that you have seen uh, as you've reviewed inventories during your time at the Commissioner's office? Yeah, sure. So um, most of what we see uh, really deals with brokerage accounts and, and stock holdings. Um, we see a lot of, you know, just listing that I have a Vanguard account and this is the market value, but not listing any of the holdings within that account. Um, another thing that we see typically is just basic math errors like you go through and you prepare the inventory, you list the number of shares, you list the price per share and the total, um, but the total doesn't equal the number of shares times the price per share. And, and when there's a variance there, uh, then, then the auditor will reach out to you. Um, another thing that, that people also kind of get confused about when, when filing the inventory and figuring out when to file it is when it's due. So they may qualify as trustee, and then they may wait several months before they get any assets distributed to them from the estate. And what we need to focus on for as far as the due date is, um, the inventory is due four months after the date of the first distribution from the estate to the trust. So, um, and, and, with a testamentary trust, you may not receive all of the assets up front, you know, all at once. You may get one distribution, and then a month later you get another distribution, and then a couple of weeks later you get another. And it may take, you know, six months or a year even to get all of the assets distributed out of an estate into the trust. So um, when you are a trustee and you are wondering when do I need to file this inventory, that clock starts on the date that you receive the first distribution from the from the estate and then you have four months from that date then to file the inventory and so, even if you don't have all of the assets that you know you're going to get from an estate uh, you go ahead and file that inventory with what you do have and then you can make adjustments for that uh, on the accounting Okay. Do you need to communicate with the commissioner of accounts to let them know that you haven't received any assets if they're not yes. uh, upset with you? Yeah, yeah, because they're going to get notification that you qualified right. as trustee and they're going to be looking for you to file within four months of your qualification because they assume you've received a distribution, that's why you qualified. Okay. But that's not always the case. So you do need to communicate with the commissioner's office and say, hey, you know, I know it's been four months, I still haven't received anything. And, uh, and they're understanding. They, they truly are. They truly are. Right. They're very, very helpful with the public. Now, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to get some closing comments for you. If you can take a minute and just kind of give us your final thoughts, words of advice as far as how to prepare the inventory and get it done right the first time. Yeah, sure. So the best advice that I can give anybody who's trying to prepare an inventory uh, would be to, to go for it on your own at first um, because the trust inventory form is really not that complicated as uh, it when compared to um, a state or conservatorship uh, inventory forms and there's only four parts and and some of it's just real estate and the rest of it is just everything else so um, i would advise people to just uh, do their best and uh, make sure that they are able to ascertain the market value as of the date they receive the asset from the estate. And, uh, and I think if, if they fill out the form with that in mind, uh, things should go smoothly from there. Well, Tim, I want to thank you so much for taking the time, you know, uh, to, you know this evening to talk with us about uh, this particular topic. I mean, there's many things that the Commissioner of Account oversees and overseeing uh, the administration of a trust from the beginning with an inventory is one of those things that people frequently are asked to take upon, and frequently they're not attorneys and they're not lawyers, they're not uh, CPAs, they're just regular folks. So this kind of information is very, very helpful, and many people review these things in advance of trying to prepare those documents. So I want to thank you for this great public service. Oh, sure thing, Richard. I'm glad to help.
You know, for those of you inclined to prepare the testamentary trust inventory on your own, I, I hope this show did not confuse you, but that this show instead will provide you with some great guidance on how to do it properly. However, as Tim pointed out in his closing remarks, and I want to stress, if you get a letter from the commissioner's office telling you of an error on the inventory, do not ignore the letter. Deal with the issue promptly. And if you find yourself baffled as to how to respond to the commissioner, reach out to an attorney or an accountant who have handled the preparation of an inventory for some guidance. You know, friends, this is brings us to the conclusion of our show. I hope you found it helpful. Replays of, of shows can be viewed on the Probate Nation website and its YouTube channel. And again, thank you for visiting with us. Until next time, be safe out there.